The issue here is freedom of speech. And if the RCMP is going to go around freely preventing people's right to dissent, then we don't have freedom of speech in Canada. That sounds very Argentinian to me. Tonight, and for the rest of the week, we're going to look at one man's struggle for justice. A struggle that many people believe is fundamental to the survival of freedom of thought in this country. On November the 1st, 1977, right here in the legislative chambers which lie behind these oaken doors, I rose in my place and asked the Attorney General of Ontario, Mr. Roy McMurtry, a question. It was a question which was to have profound reverberations in the political life of Ontario, a question which opened up a Pandora's box. I asked the Attorney General, has the RCMP conducted an investigation into the affairs of my party, the New Democratic Party? It took Mr. McMurtry more than a month to reply to the question, but when he did, he took us all aback. He said that between 1970 and 1973, the RCMP had indeed conducted an investigation, an investigation into the so-called radical waffle wing of the NDP. And the RCMP persuaded itself that subversives had infiltrated the NDP through the waffle in order to gain for themselves credence and respectability. That was only the beginning because it raised so many critical questions. Who said the waffle was subversive? Neurotically ideological, perhaps, never subversive. Who ordered the investigation? Why was it ordered? Did the Minister of Justice know? Did the Prime Minister know? Wasn't it easy and dangerous to start with the so-called subversive waffle and move to yet other organizations? Start with the waffle and move to the League for Socialist Action, for example, and men like Ross Dowson? Mr. Dowson, as a journalist, did you ever write any articles advocating violence? No, sir. Did you ever give any speeches inciting anyone to riot? No, sir. Did you ever break any of the laws of this country that threaten national security? No, sir. I have never broken any such law. What views, in your opinion, did you hold that could possibly justify the systematic campaign of harassment? My views are very easy to ascertain. I have spoken them, I have written them, and I've had them published over a great number of years. As a Canadian, I've always been led to believe that it is not only my right, but my responsibility to act upon my views. So you can't find any reason to justify this campaign against you? No, sir. Thank you. I know Mr. Dawson. I've met Mr. Dawson. His thoughts don't frighten me, but suppression of his thoughts should frighten you. Mr. Dawson, there seems to be some confusion here. Let's get a few matters cleared up. Were you or were you not the leader of the League for Socialist Action? Yes. I was elected executive secretary of the League from the time of its inception in 1961 until 1974, at which time I made a motion that I be replaced by a younger person. Oh, a motion on your own part, I see. Mr. Dawson, is it fair for me to assume that the members of the League for Socialist Action are persons whose ideas are deeply influenced by the works of Leon Trotsky? Yes, that's more or less correct. Then, Mr. Dawson, you're a Trotskyist. Yes, we are identified with those views in the broad left. That same Trotskyist movement, who in 19, 1969 at their World Congress endorsed the use of, of guerrilla warfare as a revolutionary tactic. I believe, sir, that such tactics are justified, perhaps even essential, in the fight against extremely repressive regimes. Did Leon Trotsky write a book entitled In Defense of Terror? Trotsky objected to that title. This book is now called Terrorism and Communism. And, and that book, that book tries to justify the overthrow of lawful governments by the use of force and the use of violence, doesn't it? No, that is not true. Trotsky defended the right of the working class to overthrow repressive regimes, just as the capitalist class did before them against the feudal regimes. I see. And Trotsky was telling us that 
violence was okay for the working class. Thank you, Mr. Dowson. I never really knew Ross Dowson. I always regarded the LSA as entirely eccentric, maybe faintly demented, certainly on the fringe of the left, but never subversive, never dangerous in the sense in which the RCMP regards it. And I resent, as a Democrat, on his behalf, that he should have been harassed by the RCMP. Your Honor, I have no further witnesses today, but tomorrow I will be cross-examining the RCMP about this campaign of criminal acts carried out against Mr. Dowson and his associates solely because of their views and thoughts. new serial dramatization based on the Creever and McDonald Commission's hearings. Ross Dowson's lawyer, Harry Capito, is cross-examining the RCMP. He's attempting to establish why Dowson and his associates were harassed by the security force. Why did the RCMP consider such extreme measures as being necessary? We were concerned with the violent elements represented in these groups and felt that the extreme measures were justified. What were these extreme measures? Your Honor, I refuse to answer this questions and all of the questions regarding this matter on the grounds that it might tend to incriminate me. Your Honor, the witness will answer the question. Let me put the question this way. Would it be fair to say that the purpose of these measures was to sow confusion within the ranks of the League for Socialist Action? Yes. Would you also agree with me that you sought to aggravate existing conflicts between the League and other such groups? Yes. Would it be safe to say that the purpose of these measures was to create discord so that the members of these groups became preoccupied with their own problems? Yes. This is an astounding admission. The RCMP acknowledging having interfered with a legitimate political organization, one which they merely suspected without evidence was a threat to society. Let's see now the actual nature of Dowson's complaint. They were harassed over an extended period of time. In what way? The RCMP broke into our headquarters. They went to employers and informed their employers that they had in their staff dangerous revolutionaries who should be deprived of their ability to make a living. They spread malicious gossip. They infiltrated the organization with spies and agents. Who knows what else they did? It's been suggested in this court that Marxists, like yourself, advocate violence. No Marxist advocates violence. Marxists attempt to educate the working class along the lines of their interests. The question we're dealing with here is not whether you sympathize with Dowson himself, the man, or his ideals. The importance of this case is the issue itself. That's why so many people are concerned about it. I think it's important for people to ask themselves, what was Dowson doing here? I mean, Dowson was talking, Dowson was writing, Dowson was part of an organization. Uh, he had certain political ideas, he was expressing them. And what were the police doing here? The police were disrupting, the police were preventing him from exercising those freedoms. When they do that, they threaten democratic freedoms. The police become the threat. The police are the threat. The Dowson case is a clear example of one of the disruption activities carried on by the RCMP under what was known as Operation Checkmate. It's the only one where the participants or the subjects of the disruption operation have come forward and sought legal redress. I have to explain to my clients coming from Regent Park or some disadvantaged area that they're not above the law. The law applies to them and they get dealt with accordingly. The police aren't dealt with at all. They feel, are encouraged to feel by the Attorney General that they can do whatever they feel like doing in pursuit of what they think is right. To me, that's wrong. The government of Canada owes it to the public to prosecute, to lay those charges where they should be laid, and to give those suspected RCMP officers their day in court. I know Mr. Dawson. I've met Mr. Dawson. His thoughts don't frighten me but suppression of his thoughts should frighten you. Quite naturally, lawyers were among the first to recognize the fundamental principle at stake in Dowson's case. 
so extensive is their concern that many of them have offered their services free of charge to investigate this injustice. Dowson's case centers around the fundamental fact that he did not break any of the laws of this country, nor did he pose a clear and present danger. The central point is that he was being persecuted because of his views, his ideas, and his thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Capito. What area do you intend to cover next? Your Honor, tomorrow I intend to review the chronology of crimes that the plaintiff alleges were committed against him and his colleagues by the RCMP. In particular, the operation known as Checkmate. Citizens of Canada should be outraged that a man like John Riddell, who holds an off-center political view, should be the object of such an intense, covert campaign by the RCMP to discredit him in the eyes of his family and his friends. Monday, November 13th, 1972, Paris. Got my first poison pen letter. Unsigned today. I think I know who and why. They've certainly directed their venom at the wrong target. The bastards. <sighs> Expect there will be another in a while. That's fine. Let's see what the grapevines say in the underground. Mrs. John Riddell was the wife of the man who would succeed Dowson as leader of the League for Socialist Action. The letter she received stated that her husband was showing signs of mental illness and that he was incapable of continuing his work. Now, John Riddell had, on a few occasions, visited a psychiatrist, but always on behalf of somebody else. But this sort of phony letter, supposedly written by friends, was typical of Operation Checkmate. Did the RCMP write an anonymous letter or cause an anonymous letter to be written to Mrs. Riddell? Yes, the RCMP did send an anonymous letter to Mrs. Riddell. Was this letter authorized by senior RCMP officers? Yes, it was. The next question arising from this was, how did the RCMP gain access to Riddell's confidential medical records? Statements made in front of the Creever Commission in 1979 raised suspicions that it was done illegally. Did these clandestine RCMP operations have a name? Yes. And what was that name? Operation Checkmate. And what was its purpose? Well, the purpose of an organization or individuals were at cross purposes with the maintenance of the domestic stability. We felt that we could neutralize them. You mean you felt you could break them up with criminal acts, don't you? We were used to living with certain illegalities. They were so commonplace. They were not thought of as being illegal. We did not see them as being illegal, but as fundamental. In other words, you found this perfectly acceptable. What we've done is relatively banal compared to other intelligence services. But the point is, it was not banal, nor was it limited. There are many operations of a similar nature under the code name Checkmate. The Creever Commission and parallel to it the McDonald Commission painted a shocking picture of the RCMP's Dirty Tricks Department. It was even revealed that the records for this operation were shredded. But above all, these commissions left anyone who was aware of their findings asking themselves a question. A question no one in the free world should have to ask. Can we trust the police? I want to turn my attention to the extent and nature of Operation Checkmate and the other RCMP operations we have heard about in this court. 
what kind of things did the RCMP Dirty Tricks Department feel justified in doing against some citizens of this country? Setting fire to private property. Bugging private telephone conversations. Illegal opening of private mail. Immobilizing vehicles by pouring salt into their gas tanks. Slanderous and disruptive phone calls. Breaking, entering, and tampering with private files. Filing false income tax returns to create trouble and confusion. Electronic eavesdropping on private conversations. And blackmail and countless other incidents. In perpetrating these incidents, did you know you were committing criminal acts? These were not criminal acts because they were part of the countermeasures to protect national security. But it's been established that you destroyed the records of these operations. If you didn't know they were criminal acts, why did you burn the records? I think you'll agree with me with national security at stake that extreme measures are often needed. In what way was national security at stake? Our investigations clearly established that there was a very real threat to national security. Isn't it true, officer, that your real targets were the NDP? And the labor movement? That is totally untrue. Our targets were dangerously subversive elements working towards a violent revolution. But you violated, did you not, the very laws you were supposed to protect and serve? As I said before, I was doing my duty. And my duty is to protect the security of this country within the terms of the federal mandate that we have been given. It strikes me that you were engaged in thought control, not the prevention of crime. And thought control is what it was. You see, the RCMP expect the public to extend to them a degree of trust. But in a democracy, we don't need trust. We need the rule of law. Otherwise, our society will be no better than a totalitarian regime where anything can happen to anyone at any time. The RCMP approached me showed me photographs of myself and another man in compromising positions. He told me that if I didn't play ball, they'd mail these photographs to my parents and my employer. What did they want you to do? They wanted me to infiltrate this organization and be their spy, which reluctantly I did. Is this the sort of thing we want in this country? How can we be sure it won't happen again? Indeed, how do we know it's not going on right now? The only way to demonstrate that no one, neither the government nor the RCMP, is above the law is to make sure that the rule of law is strictly adhered to and that any wrongdoer is brought to court to stand trial. in the press the other day, Roy McMurtry's response to the inquiries that Stephen Lewis made, I was outraged. Imagine McMurtry called me a subversive. The RCMP, not the LSA, not Dowson, it's the RCMP that's subversive. The people of this country should become well acquainted with the RCMP's dirty tricks, and they should be acquainted with the fact that the government of Canada was complicit in these dirty tricks. You're absolutely right, Ross. There's no doubt in my mind about it. But the key thing is, can the RCMP use such extreme measures and tactics against individuals like you solely because of your views? In other words, do we want to have a thought control police in this country. This is the case which should be permitted to come before the courts, but since it hasn't, so far, we will attempt to demonstrate for you the basic arguments that would be presented. Your Honor, 
There are a number of questions posed by this case that must be answered if the courts of this country are to retain any credibility. And your questions are, Mr. Capito? If the RCMP is to target groups and individuals on the basis of their views, who decides whether such views are legitimate or not? Your Honor, the RCMP were given a mandate by the federal government to make those decisions. They simply carried out their duty. What kind of grounds and what sort of evidence should be used in order to justify treating such views or ideas as subversive? Your Honor, we're not dealing here with harmless citizens. These people were revolutionaries. And anyone who promotes change brought on by undemocratic and violent means can hardly be surprised to find themselves of interest to the security service. Why shouldn't any person who finds himself in such a situation be permitted to defend himself from such allegations? The RCMP is the foundation of stability in this country. They are accountable to their superiors, not to some potential target. Obviously, in order to operate effectively, the RCMP requires secrecy. And why did the RCMP target my client, Ross Dowson, a person who was totally public in all his actions and views, who has participated in elections, and who has given a number of public forums, but never advocated the use of violence or the breaking of any laws. I hardly need tell your honor that membership in a legitimate political party does not guarantee one protection from RCMP surveillance. Why is the RCMP targeted individuals and groups who are merely advocating social change? The security service perceived certain groups as posing a greater danger to the social stability of the country than other groups. The client of my learned colleague happened to be the leader of one of those groups. Does the RCMP view its role as a defender of the status quo? The RCMP sees itself as the defender of national security. Isn't it strange that subversives are found only within the labor movement and its parties, only among the poor, the dispossessed, and the powerless? Moved as I sometimes have been by the rhetoric of my learned colleague, I need not remind your honor that the issue at stake here is not rhetoric, is not words, but national security. Thank you, gentlemen. I have now heard the case for the plaintiff and the case for the defendant, and I am now prepared to render my verdict.